Hello and welcome to this um, session of um, Practice as Research Seminar Series. Um, it's really hot where I am. I hope that um, some of you are a little bit more comfortable. Um, it's not so much the heat that gets to me as the humidity, to be honest. It, it feels very sticky. So I hope that you, you're all a little bit more comfortable than I am. <clears throat> I am really, really excited to have with me a fantastic guest today. Um, and and I know that this is going to be an, an, a really, really quick hour. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a um, um, sort of breakout as to how this is going to work. Um, I am going to introduce our speaker and then I'll hand over to Kay um, for, for our talk. And um, we've agreed that she'll be doing a talk for about 30 minutes or so to give us plenty of opportunities to discuss. I know some of you will be happy to raise your hands really or virtually and unmute yourselves and share your camera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't feel comfortable um, in that way, do feel free to post any questions into the chat box and I will raise it for you. Um, so please do make a use um, make use of that chat function. OK, I will keep an eye on it so you don't have to worry about that. Um, um, I, if there are any questions or conversations that you're missing, I'll pick up on that afterwards. So don't worry about that. So um, I've also put, put um, a few links into the chat box for you um, for the Practice as Research Network, um, as well as the video and the audio feeds through Buzzsprout and YouTube. Um, so I'm going to start introducing our guest today. Um, this is Dr. Kay Sidebottom, um, who is a lecturer in education and program director. Um, for a new um, MSc education at the University of Stirling. Her current research explores how teachers can work with post-human ideas to facilitate meaningful and disruptive education spaces for our complex times. With a background in community and adult education, her pedagogical specialisms include critical, radical and anarchist um, education, arts-based practice and community philosophy. And I'll be honest with you, um, the reason I know Kay's work and Kay is actually through the arts based community where I'm, I'm, I'm also um, a member. Um, and when I approached Kay to say, would you be prepared to do something for the practice as research seminar series? Um, she was very, very obliging. But not only was she obliging, she straight away said, oh, what about I do something around more than human participants? And obviously, this is something that I jumped on straight away because it's a topic that's truly exciting, quite different from any other topic that we tend to hear, because usually you hear about sensitive topics and vulnerable participants and children. So actually going to, you know, looking at ethics um, with more than human participants, that was particularly exciting. So I'm not going to, um, you know, like waste any more of, of, of precious time. I'm going to hand over to Kay um, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll open up for questions afterwards. Kay, over to you. Thanks so much, Nicole, um, for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to share um, my slides. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yes, yeah, thanks. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for the, the invite as well. It's great to be here. And thanks to everyone for coming along on such a hot. Um, stuff the afternoon in a bit of a strange um, life imitating art moment I've just had to close my window because there's some oyster catchers nesting outside and they make a real racket um, so we've got our more than human participants kind of already present um, which is which is nice but loud so hopefully they won't um, interrupt us too much uh, but yeah so I'm Kay I'm based up in Scotland at the moment I'm at the University of Stirling and it's very hot up here as well so please bear with me if um, I slow down at any point, but I've tried to make this quite interactive in terms of the things that I want you to maybe um, help me with, actually, and, and have a think about, because these ideas, I think, are very much still emerging um, for me as well. It's I suggested this topic because it's something that I'm thinking through and, you know, certainly have no conclusions about. So I might ask you to put some things in the chat and obviously we can have a, a great discussion as well. 
So it, the original kind of idea evolved really when I was doing that classic thing of looking at an ethics form. Um, and as we know, start of projects, you have your kind of tick box um, form that you need to fill in and thinking, you know, how do we account? How do I account within this framework for the participants that aren't human within the project that I'm undertaking? Where can I ask them for consent? Where can I ask them if they want to withdraw? And I'll tell you a little bit about more about that project um, later and why it was important but it's got me thinking about this idea of how we're kind of always and ready already entangled with with the more than human the non-human in so many ways but there's no fit there's no space for it within our kind of standard certainly western uh, research frameworks so the quote on the the first slide here comes from um, Rebecca Tamas and um you can read it for yourselves, but it's very much, I think, in tune with this thinking about entanglement. So Tamas is speaking here about how when you read a book, it's affected, it's impacted by the location in which you read it. It's never the same book um, and the reading is never the same because you're affected by everything that's going on around you. And I think everyone probably can relate to that um, to a certain degree. So the entanglement, the impact of setting, of atmosphere on the environment, um, all shapes how things unfold for us. The environment and the inhabitants are active participants in shaping our research processes, just as they, they shape the thinking that Tamas is talking about here. If anyone's familiar with Karen Barad's work, um, Barad proposes that all things human and non-human are in a constant state of exchange and that these exchanges a result of things working inseparably. And Barad is a physicist, so this isn't, a, you know, it's obviously a philosophical statement, but it's very much um, a real scientific statement. We're related, we don't have the kind of boundaries that, that we often think we do between us and the rest of the world. So these exchanges are what Barad calls interactions, entangle us all the time, humans and non-human companions, and they disrupt whether we account for it or not. Um, our usual human-centered activities of research, working, reflecting, and so on. So I've got a, a few kind of provocations here. I often start um, presentations with these just to start to attune us a little bit to the, these ideas and um, have a think about these questions. You might want to pop your thoughts in the chat. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear what you say about these, actually. But they're kind of thinking about this kind of entanglement with the non-human, with more than human others. So have you ever walked into a room and sensed the atmosphere? Have you walked into a space and somehow felt there was something going on or something had happened before and it was kind of still hanging in the air? If you're a sports fan, you know, you have you experienced that feeling in a, a football stadium, for example, that kind of goes beyond what we can actually identify or put language to? The second one, have you been um, affected by your teaching or research practice by smell, temperature, colour, sound and light? Obviously, temperature really uh, pertinent today. We all know that we operate differently in times of kind of great heat, great cold, and, and certainly our participants will, will do as well. But again, all of these things about the body, we don't often turn to. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we just totally discount the fact that we have bodies. Um, and we just think about what's happening in our heads. And lastly, um, have you ever been interrupted by more than human others in your researchly undertakings? I quite like that phrase, so I've put it in there. Um, more than human others might be a fly buzzing in the room. It might be um, a dog barking. It could be um, something entering the room that you didn't expect and so on. Has that ever happened? And, and what did that produce? So. Yeah, have a, have a think, share, share your thoughts about those. And these are just examples, really, I think, of um, the way in which we're kind of interacting with, with these elements all the time. And I guess I'm thinking very much here and in this presentation generally about things like animals, insects, plants and so on. But of course, there's also the, the more than human in terms of the biological. So if we think about viruses such as COVID and how that has interrupted um, life. Technologies as well, of course, absolutely entangled and in affecting and, and interacting with us all the time. 
so I'm going to catch up um, with the chat just very briefly because I know there'll be interesting things in here. Mike said lunar cycles, which is fascinating. But yeah, the feeling of going into a library that when you wrote that, Julie, about immediately feeling cooler, that's really interesting. That's such a sensation that, that, that really kind of resonated with me. Weather, of course, um, absolutely. Mosquitoes, um, I actually know someone who did a, a project recently and actually had a whole piece about the impact of the mosquito um, on the practice. So yeah, really interesting and birdsong as well. So thank you. Yes, do, do feel free to, to keep discussing those. Um, but just to move on and I suppose give a little bit of theory, I suppose, behind all of this. Um, and we're going to talk about the concept of affects again, which, which some of you may well be familiar with. Um, but affect, and I'm going to quote from Anna Hickey Moody here, is, quote, the virtuality and materiality of the increase or decrease affected in a body's power of acting. And what Hickey Moody is talking about here is how this kind of um, this force, this kind of imminence manifests through social relationships, but also importantly, through human and non-human interactions as well. So it isn't just about the human and the social, it's about the other things that are going on that are impacting us, that are affecting us, that change the way that we behave, either in a good way, perhaps, or, or possibly negatively. And that idea that humans are affected by their environment, by the energies of others, the objects in a room or decor even, you know, we often acknowledge it, I think, when we talk about research or teaching, but we don't always know what to do with that knowledge. We can't always properly account for it. We might not have the language to. Um, and so the transmission of affect, how it kind of moves, how it changes us, is, as um, Brennan suggests, a conceptual oddity. So it's a phenomenon that doesn't really fit in a world where we very much overlook the body unless it doesn't fit in some way. It might be unruly or it might be out of place. And the same with naturalized others are often discounted um, in, in that relationship. Nonetheless, we make decisions consciously or unconsciously every day that relate in some way to this idea of kind of atmosphere and the role of non-humans in the way that atmosphere is created. And that might be around things like the placing of furniture or um, our seating arrangements, that the choice of the venue for an interview, um, selection of the activities that, that we call research. So this then raises the questions, what happens when we pay attention to how people feel affected, to the way that objects, things, non-humans interact with us? And what might change um, when we reinscribe research as a process of working with these sort of multiplicities of different bodies that are in relation um, with each other? So what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of this presentation, kind of building on these provocations, these questions. So what does that mean then if we start to take these things on board? Um, what might the implications be? And I'm going to say a few words just about post-humanism and new materialism, just because it's kind of my ontological grounding, if you like. Um, and some of you may be familiar, some of you not, not so familiar with that. And then what does it mean then if we take what I might call a material turn if we turn towards these ideas. The adventure in the Yorkshire Dales was the research project where I started really thinking about this idea of working with more than humans as participants. And I'm just going to close by saying a little bit about what that means in terms of um, perhaps a move towards a new ethics. So post-humanism, um, apologies, as I say, for those who are familiar with the theory, if you're not, I'm um, just going to say a few words about it and why um, it's been so important in my thinking. So I first um, engaged with post-human thinking back in 2015. And this was at uh, Professor Rosie Bradotti's summer school in Utrecht. And at the time I was working as a, a teacher trainer, so I was preparing people for work in schools, colleges, um, community education. And I'd become quite disillusioned, I think, with the instrumental kind of transactional um, nature of education systems and practices. So this was very much about exploring a new paradigm that might open up new ways of thinking, particularly around complexity um, and, and difference. 
So the kind of posthumanism that I work with is critical posthumanism, and it differs from other strands that you might have come across, things like actor network theory, transhumanism, anti-humanism. So it isn't about robots. People often think um, it's all about that, but it isn't. It's not a philosophy as such, but what Bray Dotty would call a theoretically powered cartographical tool. So it's a kind of mapping tool or a lens through which we can view the world and, and start to see connections, issues, and, and maybe how to address them. So posthumanism is essentially a final call. And this is a quote to mark the end of the self-reverential arrogance of a dominant Eurocentric notion of the human and to open up new perspectives. And that's um, Bray Dotty and Lava Yoba. So in this sense, then, a uh, post in the post-humanism means going after humanism beyond it. So acknowledging that humanism has had benefits, particularly around things like equalities, identity and so on. But there are limitations. And that's all about the image on the screen here regarding the kind of reification of that Vitruvian type of human, um, which has always been held up as the kind of ideal, perhaps, to which we should aspire, um, certainly since kind of Enlightenment times, Enlightenment thinking. So that's Vitruvian in the sense of being white, male, European, able-bodied, neurotypical, um, straight, or implied straightness, perhaps, and so on. Um, and so if we start to think, OK, this isn't the kind of human that we recognize um, necessarily, we might not relate to that, we might not be that, um, but we need to perhaps take that kind of human a little bit down off the pedestal and start to explore what happens when we think of what a, a different humanity might look like. So post-humanism then requires us to make two moves. The first one is to go beyond or after humanism, the humanism that reified this kind of idea of man, um, and re position and augment the voices of those who've been overlooked and oppressed by those enlightenment ideas of humanity. The second move is post-anthropocentrism, which is very much about decentering the human and elevating other species and ecological systems which have been relegated. So if you think of the pyramid with man at the top, that kind of hierarchy um, has been exploitative, it's been limiting, and we can see the fallout, I think, now clearly in terms of climate change. So these two ideas come together, post-anthropocentrism and post-humanism, um, and those ideas are often dealt with separately, actually. So I think by bringing these two things together, we start to realise, actually, we have to have very complex non-binary responses to, to the questions of our times. You can't separate the two moves out if you think about things like how climate change is entangled with colonialism, for example, that very much um, connected. So post-anthropocentrism has been really interesting um, for me, to, certainly in terms of thinking about my own research, this idea of thinking differently about how we relate to the world um, and encouraging notions of kinship in different ways with non-human others. Um, accepting the complexity of that and, and reframing our attachment to the shared world that we're in. So critical posthumanism asks us to make an effective turn towards the kind of social justice that accounts for and celebrates difference between humans and their more than human counterparts. And this is very much about a process of defamiliarization. So it's thinking we have dominant visions and dominant ways of doing research, of educating, of schooling, of learning, and so on. Um, but if we turn to things like affect, we start to realise that we have a very entangled and complex relationship and response to the world. So the projects I've been involved with recently are very much around this idea of decentering, um, defamiliarising, and moving from the next slide has got this idea of moving towards an egotistical worldview. So rather than that pyramid, um, egotistical with humans at the top and everyone else being kind of seen as lesser in some way, we start to flatten that hierarchy um, and see what that changes for us. So as Lupinacci and Happel say here, um, in human-centric thinking, all non-human beings are inferior to humans, and we know this is the value hierarchy. Neoliberalism relies on the acceptance that anything other than that is less than, 
and is therefore excluded from the centre. Uh, reduction to a commodity is rationalised based on this hierarchy. So these hierarchical ideals, I think, are very much entangled, be it human or non-human. You know, we have these hierarchies and, and post-humanism is all about troubling and problematizing those and looking at the way that they're embedded in, in a lot of the work that we do. So the implications then of all this thinking um, for research practice, one of the first questions I had was uh, very much around this idea of um, ecocentric thinking. So why shouldn't we then learn from more than human others and value their knowledge um, and think about and explore what our relations with them produce? After all, if we work with Barad, we know that we're already interacting, that these um, more than human others are already always already present. So what happens when we start to learn from them and, and turn uh, towards them? This quote from Vandenberg and Resvani, I think, raises these really important questions. Um, so methodologically, more than human thought engages the other than human, both biotic and abiotic, as active participants in everyday life and the research process and environment. In so doing, more than human thinking points to the importance of sensory, effective and embodied of sources of information and foregrounds the other than human as an active collaborator in the research process rather than inert matter acted upon and understood by the researcher. So that was a fairly key statement in terms of my thinking. What does that mean then if we start to, um, to view these active collaborators uh, rather than that inert matter? We're held back, of course, this isn't an easy thing to do for, for a number of reasons. Um, certainly with English as the language that we use, or certainly the language that I use, the point that I'm coming from, um, we don't have the words. We don't necessarily have the words in language to, to deal with this, to account for this. And I think particularly uh, the kind of liberal positioning of man, you know, the rational thinking human um, of rights discourse, for example, all of these things are encoded, I think, particularly in a kind of westernized research practice. And much is written, I think, Vandenberg and, and Resvani write brilliantly on this, and, and other people are exploring these ideas. But I think very often we're missing the obvious point that there are entire non-Western non nations who already relate very differently with the natural world and, and have these, these answers in a way, um, not positioning the world as a separate bounded entity. Um, and they have never made the distinction between the agency and animacy of humans and non-humans um, in the first place. So the, these ideas already exist. And of course, the danger there is to then appropriate and use them um, in that kind of ongoing process of kind of extractive research um, capitalism. So when I'm talking in the next slide about um, indigenous knowledges, I, I want to be really kind of careful here because for me, it felt really important to engage with scholarship and, and to work with indigenous researchers um, around this kind of thinking in, in answer to the, the questions and exploring the projects that I was working on. But of course, there's no kind of one concept of indigeneity. Um, so I'm trying to be careful not to kind of conflate um, and speak for all indigenous wisdom here. But there, I think saying that there probably are some common themes um, and these are some that I've drawn out. Indigenous ont ontologies are very contextual. They're deeply rooted in the land um, that they come from. And so in the research project I'm gonna talk about in a moment, I wanted to work with some of these ideas, but to think through our own connections. So what that meant to us as people um, based in England, in the UK, and to think about what that meant for us in terms of connections with land and place. Tyson Yonker Porter, an Aboriginal scholar, um, reminds us that the, the assistance people need is not in learning about Aboriginal knowledges, but remembering their own. And I think that's, that's something really important to work with a little bit further. So these questions um, and the points on here come from the work of Robin Walkimera, who's a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation in North America. And I think when I was um, exploring and thinking about research practice and what that might look like, 
these ideas of relationality, of reciprocity, of gifting um, and relationships, to, you know, rethinking our relationships came through as really, really important and led on to the way in which um, we, we enacted the, the research project itself. So I'm going to talk briefly about the project that we did. So it took place about a year ago now. I think Mike, who's here, um, was an integral part of the project. So you might want to say a little bit more about it in a minute. But um, what I wanted to do was to bring uh, a number of teachers together to think through the research question, that kind of classic uh, tool that we have in our research projects, which was what can we learn from more than human teachers? So what happens if we decenter humans as being the only kind of educator and start to see more than humans as teachers as well? What, what, what happens when we do that? So that was the, the project. And in April last year, we went up to the Dales, spent two or three days exploring um, and undertaking different art-based experimental pedagogical practices. We were working with fungi, water, uh, moss, trees, not elephants. I, I just like the picture. There weren't any elephants there, unfortunately. But we were creating artifacts. We were taking photos and we were reflecting on these together working with the ideas of Strom and Lupinacci, thinking about the wise voices we don't hear, we don't consider to be our teachers, sharing stories, um, critically examining our assumptions um, about what education and teaching actually is. So what we discovered, I think, during that time was that not only the, the sort of naturalised others were playing a role, the material aspects were really important as well, so benches, dry stone walls, the building where we were staying, that was also part of our kind of decentering um, the human thinking differently um, about our, ourselves in relation. We learned a lot, as you would expect, about things like rhizomatic communities, so thinking with fungi, um, things like symbiosis, relationality, um, communal uh, ways of being, adapting and kind of queerness. So there was all, all that stuff coming out in terms of what we, we can actually learn if we only start to pay attention. In terms of the, the ethical component of this then, so back to my point at the start, how do you account for the more than human participants in your ethics form? We did a few things. And I think firstly, that idea of kind of gifting reciprocity was really important. So that, point about not taking from the environment, that point about noticing and attuning through things like place acknowledgements. And again, something that we're quite careful or really wanted to think through and the kind of danger of appropriating that, you know, it's a very different context. We can't start thinking about place acknowledgements in the way that say perhaps um, they might think them through in North America. Things like Joanna Macy's work, The Council of All Beings, which is very much about building um, empathy with more than human others and acknowledging the existence and kind of attunement practices like that were important. Um, but also having a critical awareness, I guess, became part of that gifting process in terms of thinking through issues like the fact there's very little right to roam um, in you know, England and kind of generally, the Yorkshire Dales are quite problematic in terms of places being overgrazed and so on. And then thinking through as well what it meant to be together as a group of humans in terms of how we interacted with each other, as well as thinking about how we interacted with the natural world. One of the other ideas we drew on was this um, idea, it's another one from Walt Kimmerer, around the grammar of animacy. So not referring to more than human others as it, as we often do in the English language, but also resisting the need that we often have to label things and identify them. So you see a tree and your first move might be, oh, what kind of tree is it? So trying to step away from that. Walt Kimmerer uses the word kin to refer to non-human others and expands it into a verb kinning, which is reflecting action and process. So thinking about life as movement, as change and growth. And the Anishinaabe language often uses verbs 
rather than nouns. So we have a very noun based language. So thinking about how we could use language differently. So kinning is that process of gifting reciprocal exchange rather than extraction and treating uh, non-human others as you would perhaps a, a family member. So paying attention, noticing. Um, in the Cree language, the word for tree is ancestor. And so we were thinking about how we could turn natural phenomena into subjects rather than objects in that way. So if we were seeing trees while we were walking out and about and addressing them as ancestor, what, what changes for us in terms of our relation? Um, Donna Haraway uses something similar with pigeons. If you greet them as world travellers, how does that change and make you relate differently? In terms of the research practice, uh, we were using walking interviews, so a walking interview, and thinking very much through the participants that, um, that were already present in that walking interview, the wind, um, the trees, the water, and how they were implicated in our practice. So in terms of kind of summing up, I guess, what that meant for us in terms of ethics, the quote at the top here, it's left me, I can't see what it says behind there, but that tree's uprooted and there's fungus there. So this was a quote from one of the interviews um, where someone was talking through how they felt about the project and then was distracted by a, a fallen tree. And ordinarily, that might be the kind of thing that you edit out or you don't take notice of. But what we were trying to do with these walking interviews was saying, actually, we need to acknowledge there's other things and other agents here that are part of this process that are changing it in some way. So back to Rebecca Tamas's quote at the start, we're not the same. We're not thinking about this in the same way because we're entangled with these other things that are around us. So accounting for those um, and noticing them. <laughs> So the walking interviews um, draws participants into the tactical, the movement of bodies through space and time, the negotiation of paths and unforeseen interruptions. This material wandering encourages the metaphorical wandering of thoughts and the expression of affect, such, um, such that may not find proper expression in the visible strategic finds voice. And that's a quote from Kunst and Presnell, who write a lot about this idea of the walking interview and what changes when you start to not only account for the human um, participants. I've shared all the, the references as well at the end um, if people want to look into those. So problematizing, I think, firstly, kind of what counts as research, that's kind of a, a basic assumption around this idea of defamiliarizing and saying, actually, there's more to this than just um, someone in dialogue. There's much more happening here. Secondly, kind of acknowledging those, the liberal frameworks that many participatory research approaches draw upon. So as I said before, we have particular um, Western frames around justice, around rights and inclusion that are predicated on certain understandings about who we are and our ways of being. Individual autonomy, agency, this idea of rational thinking and dialogue. So by taking a more than human approach, we can really start to problematize this because it starts to show, actually, this is only one way of seeing the world and there, there are many others. By using these questions, we can start to challenge other biases. So we're not only um, by including the sort of naturalized others, we're all, and we're also querying the processes because we're asking very deep ontological questions um, about what research is and why it's done in particular ways. Expanding these ethics raises massive questions which are really difficult to answer. We don't have the language necessarily um, and we might be fearful of being uh, anthropomorphizing and so on. So there's lots to learn, I think, through this. And I'm only at the, the very start of that process. So what does it mean um, for a tree to consent, for example, or, or have the right to withdraw? Um, how do we start to work towards that? And the last, last point I think that came out of this project was around time, and I won't go into it now because everyone's heads are probably already spinning a little bit, but this idea of a slow ontology, you know, not thinking about projects in that same linear fashion, because again, that's a, a very particular way of understanding time, of understanding progress and so on. And in reality, of course, if we look at seasons, back to Mike's idea of lunar, 
patterns and so on, time can, can work very differently. So I've thrown quite a lot at you there, um, but I'm going to stop in a moment and just to, to sum up very briefly, I think these processes of questioning ethical arrangements of decentering the human act quite a, a well as a, a querying exercise, which allow different ontological positions to enter our research equation. And they cut to the heart, I think, of questioning the foundational categories of Western liberal thought that we're forced to accept through the way that things are entrenched. Van der Berg suggests these kind of more than human practices teach us how, quote, nature organises and is organised by complex power relations. And these include sexuality and gender, pointing out how acts of division that categorise and demarcate the natural world also included binaries of male, female, developed, underdeveloped, civilised, savage, and so on. So taking a queer perspective on nature sees the violence in this boundary making, which is enacted through research and seeks to trouble it and, and undo it. So three kind of key points um, around the processes that I was involved with, this idea of relationality, collectivity, reciprocity and entanglement, challenging human exceptionalism in the stories we tell about the world and how new knowledges are formed. And I think I haven't said much about um, our practices, but we need things that allow us to take an imaginative leap in order to get into these spaces, because it's hard to do um, without things like art, poetry and so on to start to really reconnect um, and think in different ways. I've put um, on the end loads of references here um, and happy to share those and connect, talk about any of this um, with people outside of the session today if there's things that you want to follow up. But I'm going to stop sharing now because I want to hear what everyone else thinks. Thank you very, very much. Um, a round of applause um, at the moment just for me, but nonetheless. Um, thank you very, very much, Kay. It's been really super, super exciting. Um, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, some um, people have been having conversations in the background. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that have been going on there. Um, I can share with you the chat um, after today so you can see what the kind of conversations were that went on. Um, there is a question in the chat box. Um, I'm not sure if the person would like to come in or if, if I'm supposed to be reading that out. Um, I suppose I'm going to read it out. So there's a question there. In the context of critical disability studies and assistive technology, how can we implement a post-humanist approach to participatory design of robots? This is something I'm grappling with in my PhD project and actually applying these theories in practice. So there we go. Handing that over to you, Kay. Yeah, that's a massive question. That's a big I know, I know. Yeah, um, disability as well, I think, is so um, kind of under thought about in post-human thinking. So I'm really glad you mentioned it, Christina, because um, I think a criticism of post-humanism, certainly critical post-humanism, quite rightly, is disability is often the thing that, that isn't talked about enough. So it's, um, it's important that you're asking this. Um, I think one of the things, and I, I'm not particularly familiar with things like robot design or technology in that way, but I suppose my first thought is to sort of turn to some of the ethical writing that's been done around post-human thinking. So I'm thinking particularly about Bray Dotty's affirmative ethics um, and the way in which we need to think through any kind of technological advances in a way that kind of, again, decenters that Vitruvian ideal um, and turns to difference as a kind of affirmative positive. So I would say, certainly, um, if I was to think through that question a little bit more, affirmative ethics would probably be my first port of call. Uh, but I want to, yeah, I'll think more about that, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay. Thank you. Um, I have got one hand up um, and then there is a question in the chat box. So can I ask Julie to come in first? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to say I was very lucky. I have a colleague uh, in science education from Canada and they organized through their university a, a series of uh, conferences with pre-scholars who had gone through Western 
science education or other types of education. So it was very interesting as an experience for me because they were talking about nature in very different terms to the terms that we are used to. And I think I'm finding a lot of resonance with uh, this uh, uh, presentation. I'm very happy actually I signed up for it. But I wanted to ask a little bit of self-criticism here. Very recently, someone was talking about how like um, uh, animals were dying and the way that they were dying, they thought the people who were uh, talking, it was on a social platform, they were like, these animals are now experiencing this, the equivalent of us, like looking at our lives going through in front of our eyes and blah, blah, blah. And my reply and my comment, and I'm embarrassed, but I think if we don't criticize ourselves, we'll never change. My comment was the biology, the science of death uh, is very, very uh, well documented through biological changes, biochemical changes and all that. Whatever else you assign to the, to the animal, I, I kind of like dismissed it. I was like, you're generalizing. You really don't know what's happening for pigs, for example. Um, if you chase them before you kill them, the, the meat becomes more tender. For cows, it's the opposite. You can't really generally. I was, I was very dismissive. And, uh, and of course, I criticized myself. But then in reflection, because I do that a lot, um, I thought, you know, I shouldn't have been dismiss dismissive first off. And then on the other hand, I'm thinking all of us that identify or have gone through the Western science education model or the Western education model in general, I wouldn't trust us to know how what the experience of the animals is when we go through that. And I wanted to say, embarrassed as I am, I am being very honest here because I'm like, at which point will we actually be more with more open heart or more open ears to these experiences? Because I, you know, I it's been a few days that this is still on my head that I was critical and dismissive. And I stand by the science bit, but again, if it was an indigenous person who was writing this, I would say, yes, they understand. But in terms of like everybody else, I'm much more unwilling, so, so to speak. So I'm thinking this presentation is actually maybe a, a very first step for, for many of us, it is for me. And I want it to be accelerated a little bit and I don't know how or where to place myself. Yeah, I mean, I love that that process of self-reflection. There's a lovely um, article, I can share it with you, uh, by um, Wu and other authors about ethical humility. And it's about this process of saying, you know, we need to um, to reflect and act with humility, perhaps particularly when we're working with knowledges that kind of aren't our own, you know, and all of that kind of thing. And I think that's what you kind of demonstrated here, just in that process of thinking those things through. Um, and yeah, I mean, when, when I think about my own journey, I mean, I'm coming to academia quite late on, you know, I'm one of those early career researchers who's actually really ancient, um, has probably had about six other careers. And there's so many gaps in my own knowledge, you know, when I think about my schooling, everything that I didn't learn at school, um, uh, colonialism is a classic one, you know, I just wasn't taught anything, literally anything about that. So I've had so much to learn, and I still have so much to learn. So it's an ongoing process, isn't it? Um, but Bray Dotti, and this is a, a Deleuze and Guattari idea, but this idea of kind of taking lines of flight, you know, we can't change everything. Things are too big, issues are too big. But we can take little moments or we can make little deviations. And the more that we do that, the more kind of cracks deepen. Um, so it's not necessarily about the big changes, it's about that that moment of self-reflection that you were doing, you know, that still has an impact. It shuffles things. They won't be the same after that. So I think we have to hold on to those those moments. Otherwise, we'll probably all give up tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kay. So there's a couple of um, questions that are sort of related, and I'll just wrap them together, if, that, if I may. 
Um, there's one question, which is, you know, how can we make sure when we're doing these radical things that you've proposed that we're not treading on people's toes? Um, that's the one thing. And then actually that's also then leading into, um, well, how do you then actually deal with that in a research ethics application, for example? Because obviously you are now dealing with something that's not necessarily familiar because it's so new. So it's not just about not treading on those people's toes, but also making sure that people understand what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, good questions. I think um, it's tricky. And I was on a research event um, last week, which was working with um, people who were similar kind of position in their career to me. And we were having that question about how far can you sort of push the boundaries, um, you know, working within the system. I tend to be quite kind of nomadic, I guess, in my thinking, and a little bit subversive. I try to operate um, <laughs> kind of under the radar or kind of differently in terms of how I work with other people, I suppose. So operating outside the academy, I'm, you know, I'm not particularly a big one for wanting to push against those closed doors because I haven't got the time really or, or probably the energy at my age um, either. But I think there's something to be said around interdisciplinary working as being a big opportunity here. You know, working across disciplines um, can open up all sorts of interesting spaces. And I think certainly funders are starting to cotton on to this now in terms of, you know, how things can be done differently and the importance of that actually coming from some of the, the ideas I've talked about in the presentation. So I think opening our own minds a little bit and thinking, OK, well, maybe if I hook up with someone from the natural sciences or, you know, how about if we think about this across humanities or whatever it happens to be, I think that, that can open different possibilities because you're not then retreading the steps. You're, you're maybe starting to create new turf or new spaces. Um, so that, that I think might be be one part of it. What was the second part, Nicole? So that was the bit about, oh um, yeah, about how you kind of account for it within traditional That's research right, yes. frameworks. Yeah, so I think when I was writing on my ethics application about non-human participants, I think that kind of threw people a little bit, but actually it was really, really important to the project. I think just because there isn't a space for it now that doesn't mean you can't kind of make a space for that or kind of weave it in there um sometimes you've got to try these things and and you know just see what can be done um people might be more open to it than you think but i think a lot of the questions still don't have answers and this is something that i'd love to talk to people more about so in the article that i mentioned the vandenberg one which i think is probably sorry just digging it out the key the key probably text actually that, that I thought when I was putting this presentation together, there's a question here by Leila Resvani and her research. And she was asking, you know, how do I interview a cabbage? And she's working with kind of farming, you know, how do I do that? What does that mean? And really interesting. And I think there's lots of routes to go down, lots of ideas to try, but we have to do it together. We have to work together and, and talk about these things. And so seeking out collaborations out out with, I'm using a Scottish phrase, which I'm quite impressed with, outside or out with the, the academy, I think it's really important. So those kind of informal networks where people have space to think about how to do this together rather than battling through the ethics stuff on your own, I think is really, yeah, that feels really important to me. Thank you very much. There's another question um, saying, well, actually it starts out with um, a thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Wonderful presentation. That's how it starts. And then it says, could you just um, tell a story or give an insight into what you have found most difficult from your experience regarding to de decentering humans or decentering yourself within the product production of situated knowledges? Yeah, there's probably lots of examples I could give. And I think um, one of the things about critical post-humanism or sort of new materialism is that it still has quite a strong feminist ethics within it. So it kind of says, actually, we can never take ourselves out of the equation entirely. You know, we're, still, we're always present in it with all the kind of social, cultural, all of that is still there as well. So... You know, it's not about saying we need to remove humans entirely. We, we can't do that. We need to still account for ourselves. Um, and that, I think, is the important part of 
transhumanism bringing those two strands um, together. So I think what I've tried to do is say, okay, this can be partial. This isn't about saying, you know, let's totally decenter ourselves because we can't do that, but it's about taking a different lens, taking a different angle. So there will be people who go probably much further with this thinking um, than I do. But I suppose to give an example, not so much of a problem, but an observation. So when we did the project in the Yorkshire Dales last year, one of the things that I anticipated, because as a researcher, or you know, you might try not to, you're always kind of anticipating the outcome, aren't you? What's going to happen? You know, what are people going to say? What are we, what are we going to find out? You can't really stop yourself doing that. And I anticipated a lot of thinking, you know, thinking with nature, thinking differently and having different relationships, maybe becoming more intimate or learning lots and perhaps wanting to relate differently as a result. And that happened uh, to a certain extent. But one of the really interesting things was about how we as humans were relating to each other differently. And actually, what occurred to me was that's just as important, isn't it? Because, you know, how we treat each other, again, is a reflection on how we treat everything else. Um, and the weekend when we ran it, and Mike, if he's still here, will remember this, was very much about kind of democratic thinking spaces. It was about creating spaces of pause, um, reflection. It was about freedom of movement, of allowing people to engage. It was very much about thinking about um, kind of people's different neurodiversities and, and how people, you know, see the world in different ways, how we account for that, um, but also how we can think together in kind of communal thinking practices, how we can generate knowledge together. And again, that was very much through working with ideas of affirmative ethics, which is about kind of taking pain and transforming it to knowledge. Um, so based in the work of, of Spinoza, if you, if you know the philosophy behind all of that. So thinking about pain to knowledge, thinking about how um, we can organise what he would call joyful encounters. So instead of negativity, it's moving through um, into spaces of joy together and what that means like in relation so it was yeah it was as much about bringing the human back in but it was bringing a different kind of human back in if you know what I mean it was rethinking um, humanity and how we are together as much as it was about decentering ourselves so a process of decentering perhaps and recentering. and I think particularly because the the residential happened in the wake of lockdown so it was when people were starting to come out and starting to be together physically in spaces again that that process actually felt really important because you know we can't make these changes and, and think differently about nature for example unless we're also being able to do that in a space where we're able to talk to each other and work together so yeah that possibly doesn't answer the question but it was it was an interesting observation for me Thank you very much. I think we've got time for one last question. And there's one in the chat box, which is, um, would you like to say more about the importance of focusing on slow as it affects time with children in school, our observations and research practice? Would that be related to your reference on slow ontology as a theoretical framework? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think if you get a chance to have a look at Jasmine Almer's work around slow ontology, um, that that will, you know, really kind of make you think about, about these processes. Because I know certainly in education, which is the area I work in primarily, just the language of speed and acceleration is incredible. Once you start to see it, you know, you can't unsee it from kind of accelerated re reader to catch up se sessions. You know, if you look at the way, particularly in the UK, school day has been um, compressed so that every minute is accounted for in terms of learning time, even to the point, this is just an aside, because it's my hobby horse a little bit, but um, the children in a lot of UK schools have to take their coats off in the playground outside the building. And the reason for that is because they will lose lesson time if they're taking their coats off once they enter the classroom. So it's even down to the management, the way that bodies are managed in terms of speed. Um, and yes, yeah, so that language cuts through the heart of all of this stuff. And we know as well, don't we, I think in terms of projects, you know, you have your project timeline, you manage that. And I was really interested in 
certainly with this project and my PhD actually, about, you know, what happens when we take it out of that box, when we say it doesn't matter whether this project finishes here. Um, it might do because I've got to satisfy a funder or I have to have my PhD in. That might be one part of it. But what happens in the meantime if this project continues to spill out in different ways, if we continue to meet or if, you know, the participants take the discussions into another space or if they use it in their own practice, you know, what, what happens um, around that? So I think for me, that's all that idea of kind of slowness and, and disrupting these ideas of kind of linear time. And certainly, um, you know, if you're working with more than human participants, you'll know that clock time obviously means nothing. Um, and we work to very different kinds of flows of energy um, and, and relationships with time. So, yeah, slow ontology, I think, is, again, a real challenge to academia as normal. Um, it's about as kind of far removed from <laughs> as you can get. This is coming from someone who's just been working on their kind of workload model, you know, for next year. So, you know, it's, it, that really interests me. But um, again, something definitely to discuss with others and think about as a mode of resistance, um, perhaps. Thank you very, very much, Kay. Can I just say there's a lot of um, thank you notes in the chat function for you. Um, a lot of people have been saying how much they've enjoyed that presentation and how much they've enjoyed also your answering the questions. Um, and there's a lot of um, people who are commenting on that in the chat box. I would just like to very briefly highlight that we have got one more seminar um, for the Practice as Research Network in this academic year. And that's going to be on the 21st of June um, with Professor Jenny Parks, who is going to talk about the ethical challenges in researching violence with young people. I have also shared, um, again, the links to the YouTube channel, the Buzzsprout channel, the podcast apps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so please do get also in touch with me if there are any questions or concerns or if you would like to um, share the network or, or con contribute to the network in any way. So again, thank you very, very much, Kay, for a lovely, lovely afternoon. And like I said, the hour goes way too quickly. Um, it was lovely to have you here. Um, and I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to, to have another sort of more detailed conversation where I can actually ask my questions um, because I didn't get to those at all. <laughs> Just popped my, if anyone's on Twitter and wants to carry on the conversation, ask me things, keep in touch, do feel free. I am obviously in other places as well. I'm easy enough to, to track down um, if people want to email me. I'm always happy to say more and discuss um, and hear people's thinking about it all. But yes, thanks for the wonderful questions as well.